All right. Hello, everyone, and happy third Thursday, last Thursday, last Thursday edition. We're at the end of the month already. We are so excited to have you here with us today. My name is Lauren, and I'm the events officer with Student Support Services and the AC Hub here at Algonquin College. As guests today, Algonquin College is proud to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on the traditional, unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. I am really looking forward to hosting today's third Thursday career building with Catherine Tremblay. Before we begin, I'm going to go over just a few Zoom housekeeping items. So today's event has closed captioning in English. To turn on closed captioning, press the CC icon along the bottom of your toolbar. This event is being recorded. The recording will be available on the third, third Thursday website in the coming days. We encourage you to we encourage you to use the chat and engage with our college community. And we will be taking questions after the talk. So please get them ready and you can submit them in either the chat or the Q&A tab along the bottom of your screen. All right, so today's third Thursday is all about answering those big questions we have after graduating. What to expect, how to get started or grow a successful career, or maybe there's even just a little interest in starting your own business. Joining us in just a few moments to share her expertise Expertise is Catherine Tremblay. Catherine is a Canadian entrepreneur with over 30 years experience specializing in the human aspect of human resources. Third Thursdays are all about sparking ideas and creating community here at Algonquin College. Every month we hear from experts and innovators who share stories that inspire and empower us to be the best we can be, no matter what that looks like. Tim, let's play the video to help share the philosophy behind Third Thursdays. Hey Algonquin College, we're launching the fifth season of Third Thursday. Third Thursdays are conversations that spark ideas and create community. Every month, we invite local experts and innovators to share stories that inspire and empower listeners. Tune in on the third Thursday of every month from your home. We challenge you to change your space into a place and we'll bring inspiring innovators from inspiring places to you virtually. Let's explore this new reality together. Students, employees, alumni, and community partners forge meaningful connections while learning from each other. The Third Thursday community is story-driven, curious, and collaborative. And we're not afraid of perspective shifts or pushing the envelope. We skip the small talk and dig deep in the topics that matter. We're here to fuel dreams through dialogue and turn passion into purpose. Come and be a part of the story. Thanks, Tim. I'm now going to pass the virtual floor over to Carol Ann Mahoney with Algonquin's Employment Support Center to introduce Catherine. Thanks so much, Lauren. And hi, everyone. My name is Carol Ann Mahoney, and I work in the Algonquin College Employment Support Center. And just very quickly, I want to let you know that our team are here to help students and graduates with career readiness, whether reviewing your resume and cover letter, assisting you to customize it to fit that perfect job, preparing you for interviews or helping you build that LinkedIn profile, we are available for you via Zoom appointments. And in the chat, Sam will add the links to our website, our services and how to make an appointment. So I now have the pleasure of introducing today's guest speaker. Catherine Tremblay is a Canadian entrepreneur with over 30 years experience specializing in the human aspect of human resources. As CEO and co-founder of XLHR, Altus Recruitment, Altus Technology, and Excel ITR, Catherine has dedicated her entire career towards, towards the betterment of the staffing process. She began her entrepreneurial journey at the age of 21 when she launched a small staffing firm in the National Capital Region. Today, she has offices in Ottawa, Toronto, and Vancouver, and Catherine's suite of companies draws employers from coast to coast providing recruitment, recruitment services, thought leadership, and consultative HR support across industries and disciplines. A champion of people, Catherine regularly serves as a career ambassador to new Canadians by offering opportunities for professional growth within her firm. She is also an avid mentor for women in the workforce and often encourages young people to pursue a career in entrepreneurship. Catherine was named the 2021 CEO of the year by the Ottawa Business Journal and Ottawa Board of Trade, and was also awarded the 2021 Trudeau Medal by the University of Ottawa's Telfer School of Management in recognition of her leadership and outstanding contributions to the business world, the community, and her alma mater. 
Catherine holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Ottawa and is fluent in French. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Catherine Tremblay. Thank you so much, Caroline. What a beautiful introduction. I have to say, when you hear yourself introduced, it, there's just something kind of inspiring about just knowing that you're, all the work that you do every day is having some form of impact. And I was very grateful to be invited to speak. I found your whole team at Algonquin extremely devoted to what you do. And uh, I include you, Lauren and, and Caroline, Samantha and Tim, all of you really um, hardworking and thank you for being you. Um, I wanted to be there in person. I love presenting in person. I like the whole eyeball effect. And uh, I got COVID. I mean, after all this time, I thought I was immune to it. And here it is. It came my way this week. So thank you for allowing this to be in a virtual environment. And I'm sorry that I don't sound possibly my best, but I'm, I'm here for you and with you. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about the business and the journey um, that I took in addition to a few entrepreneurial tips. And certainly I wanna talk about your career search. And I'm really grateful that you showed up here today because this might be the impact you need to create that career that you're looking for along with your team at Algonquin College. So I'll start just with a little bit about my story. Um, and it, it doesn't have a perfect rhyme or reason. I'm not sharing screen. I'm just really sharing with you here um, a bit about my life. So I was born and raised in Ottawa, which seems like a rare thing, but it was actually in Orleans. And uh, I started in a staffing company at 16 years old, um, went for an interview downtown on Spark Street, and I was lucky enough to secure a position there. And I loved the industry. The company I was working with was, was having a few struggles, and it didn't look like they'd make it. So I started to look for employment. I did have to fund my way through school. And so um, I started all sorts of um, different business plans with someone I worked with. His name was Tony Gamaris. And the two of us together, we'd write these crazy business plans. You know, we thought of doing like a remax of real estate. We wanted to start a funeral home. We thought of doing um, these little cereal things that like, you know, the, when you buy a cereal box and there's those little objects in it, we thought maybe we would do that. Well, sure enough, all of these ideas failed. And uh, or certainly didn't take off. I mean, maybe they didn't fail because they never really got anywhere. But um, we ended up saying, well, why don't we do staffing while we try to acquire some capital and then we can go into, you know, the funeral business. So sure enough, um, we go to the, the Royal Bank and they were kind enough to give us a very small loan of $7,500. Let's be honest, you're not going very far in business with $7,000. Anyhow, so we, we got started from Tony's apartment in the Byward market and um, just, you know, really started to create an impact um, in the way that we knew how. And that was really through sheer hard work. Um, we worked very much on the quality of the candidates we were placing, and also we worked on price, and we looked at every possible way that we could make an impact on winning the business from our competitors. So very slowly, we started to grow. What was really terrific is that at that time, and we're talking about, you know, the, the 90s, you got published every month in terms of your standings in the business. And we would rank number 74 of 74 and we'd be all devastated. Oh my goodness, you know, how could we be, you know, at the bottom of the list and we were very competitive people. And uh, so Tony and I had, had started together. I don't know if I established that, but it was a partnership between the two of us. And uh, so we basically really just kept climbing and every quarter or the next quarter we climbed by 10 and we'd see ourselves making gains. When we hit number one in Ottawa, it was actually 1995 and we've been told it'll take you 10 or 20 years to break in. Well, it didn't, you know, it was maybe a four to five year journey and we were the largest supplier to the government of Canada. From that point, we said, okay, we've, we've reached that pinnacle. Let's go to the next one. And so we then started in Toronto. Once we made significant gains with the Ontario government, we then um, went on to the private sector, started in Mississauga and then North York and uh, Vancouver and et cetera, and just continued to make gains that way. So the company continued to grow. And our goal, uh, we had gone to see, a, a, it's called Strategic Coach in Toronto. And we did this program where they said it's 10 times Mind Expander. And at this time, we were doing about 10 million in revenue. And we said, how could we ever get to 100 million? That's an unachievable number. But sure enough, we continued with our actions and our plans. And we did manage to hit that 100 million somewhere around, oh, you know, I don't even know what year it was. I was about 40. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Some of these years blur for me. Anyway, so things were looking pretty bright and beautiful in our 10 times mind expander mindset. And um, my husband, um, Tony, who was my partner in business and in life, um, we had had four children together, you know, over those years of building the business. And uh, I was a very hardworking mom. I really wanted to make a difference to moms in the workplace. I used to bring my babies, you know, to work and to meetings. 
and uh, you know, these four girls, you know, along my side. And, you know, Tony was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And, you know, I have people say to me sometimes, you know, how is it? Did he not go to the doctor? And yeah, he did. He had one of those rare aggressive forms of cancer that was unbeatable. And so in 2014, here we had reached that, that first goal that we had. And uh, he was diagnosed with cancer and, and, and it was terminal. There was no beating it. We traveled as far and wide as we could to see if we could find solutions, but that was not to be. And I want to acknowledge that some of the people here on this call, I imagine that you've had either a loss in the past or a loss that you're going through. And I want to tell you, I know how hard it is. And, um, and I'm here with you in that journey of pushing through your life and creating the best for yourselves, despite, you know, a pain point that you've experienced in loss and grief. So we continue um, on in our journey and trying to build the company through Tony's pain. Um, and, and eventually Tony did uh, pass away from cancer in 2016. And at that point, I would say that I had to really redefine myself because here I was the mom of four daughters. I certainly hadn't planned on being a single mom with a fairly sizable business. And um, yet my true love and passion being inspired by the business that we were doing. So there was a big hole there. And um, we have choices, all of us, you know, those here on this call, we have the choice to decide where are we going to be in this. And for me, it, it really showed up as wanting to be a community leader and make an impact and continue in the staffing sector. And, uh, and it, that worked for me. I mean, what I did is I hired some coaches and I got really straight with myself. I looked at my weaknesses and I replaced my weaknesses with team members who were able to fulfill some of those gaps that I had in not having Tony by my side. And I set new goals and the goals were a little different because it somehow transformed from that financial metric to be more that human capital metric that where those two things could meet, you know, kind of profit with purpose and, and where those two things, um, you know, collide. So here we were back on our trajectory to growth and we were back at that like 140 million mark and we, we were on our way and then the pandemic hit. And like all of you, listen, I'm not gonna pretend that this was all, you know, it wasn't all us, everyone went through this. We had 800 layoffs within five weeks. It was a really tough blow. Um, we had some layoffs internally. We thought we would never have to do that. We had never had a layoff. And, um, but we buckled down and we worked together and we said, you know, what, how can we show up here to get Canadians working? And our team really just, I don't know, there was an energy that came from these losses that really inspired us to get um, going and look at all of the opportunities around, you know, health screeners uh, in the construction sector, we place very senior people. Um, in that sector, and we really pivoted towards more of that. So anywhere where we saw gaps in the economy, we showed up and we got back on our track to growth. And then there was George Floyd and his murder and Black Lives Matter. And I'll never forget walking home from the office. And I had been alone at the office again because everyone was working from home. And I walked home during the peaceful protest that was taking place in front of parliament. And an employee of mine called and said, someone I knew really well and really value said, you know, are we doing enough in the space of diversity? And at first it was a little bit defensive, you know, as sometimes we show up that way, don't we? And um, I was like, oh yeah, of course, you know, we do this and this and this. But at the end of the day, she got me thinking about the fact that we were not in action. While we, we were doing things well, we weren't doing enough. We weren't making an impact in being truly allies and making a change in what is racism and what is a white dominant culture. I actually don't can tell you, I don't think I was aware that some of those premises that were underlying all of our, our community were there. And once you become aware of them and you see the impact and how you can make a difference, we started to go through the entire business from top to bottom and look for any spaces where bias could exist. And it really changed something for all of us and, you know, I'll tell you more about that if you want to talk about it later, but we reignited our newcomer program. Tony had been a newcomer from Portugal and he had found it a little bit difficult to settle in. So we reignited that program where what we do is we give a paid internship to new Canadians and try to help them get that Canadian experience on their resume to help them secure something, um, you know, uh, next for them. And then we had to relook at remote work. So here we had been, I had been pretty old school, I'll admit that. I mean, I thought you had to have your bum in the seat and you were working next to me and we were talking and I, I, I don't know where those values came from, perhaps all of the life that I had led before me. Um, but when I saw how incredibly productive and positive it was for our team members to be at home 
I had to really relook at that. And on both sides, you know, as you know, we hear people saying, we have to get back to work. It has to be normal. It has to be the old normal or the new normal. And for me, uh, we did a survey with our, our employees and our team members. And, and what they said was that they really liked the autonomy. They want to make their own choices. And what I learned in that process was the extent to which individual people, just as an, as an autonomous person, have to be able to make the decision of where they work the work they do and the employer that they choose. And I wanna be an employer of choice and I want the team members that are with us to feel compelled to do what works for them. So we went with a remote first culture and we made that commitment pretty early on. We've continued that commitment and we'll continue thereafter. And that means that our team members can work at the office if they want to, but they can work at home if they want to or from wherever they are, they want to work. And we have found our productivity to be very, very good. And we're quite happy with the decision. Now we do continue to have to work on strengthening our culture because in this you know, different um, space, it changes something. And we also have to work on internal communication. Um, and we've, we are doing that, um, but we're committed to this remote first culture. So in addition to all that, something I learned during the pandemic was that giving everything back was the way to go. So when we would experience any kind of pain point, we would host a webinar, we would invite all our clients, our competitors, anyone who wanted to join in and somehow giving back information to our community brought it back to us as well. And that was incredibly positive. And so we are back on our path to growth. We're anticipating about 165, 270 million for this year. And we have about 20, well, maybe about 2000 um, temporary co and contract workers assigned with us every day. So I want you to picture that when I told you the story from the apartment that we started in the Bywood market with two team members being Tony and myself and 150,000 in sales in our first year, you know, bring that all the way forward to, you know, 160 million or 170 million and 220 employees and 2000 plus um, contracted workers is pretty special. And uh, we're, we're very fortunate to live in this great city where we can have our headquarters and we have so many incredible team members that work alongside us in a really collegial and positive kind of what you would call a democracy. So I want to acknowledge that our next pain point is Ukraine. And I know many of you here on the call are probably suffering watching the news as well. Um, you know, we look at the impact that Ukraine will have on all of us, and we actually don't know what that looks like. We have a team member who's just managed to bring over her parents, which is so special. And, you know, we'll continue to be influenced in business by our social climate and our geopolitical climate. And it's difficult, you know, because here we are trying to navigate a business in these really difficult um, times. What worries me most is burnout. And, uh, you know, people talk a lot about the great resignation. But in Canada, that's not completely true. There are not a ton of people in Canada that are strictly leaving their great jobs and moving on to something else. Some of them are, of course, there is attrition in the 12% range, but it's not too severe. Um, it's more so the great exhaustion that worries me. I think we've all given all we have in the last two years. And I honor you for the work that you've done and being a student and trying to build also your experience and career at this time. It really is something. And uh, I know it's taken a lot for everyone. So I'm wrapping that up with the notion that I'm extremely positive about the future that we hold, but I'm also, you know, concerned about a tired economy and how we can reignite ourselves to really be on track to create power for ourselves in the future. So I'm going to turn that seems to segue to entrepreneurship. And I would encourage everyone, any age, to look at entrepreneurship as a career choice. And I don't know that it's talked about enough in schools and that it's enough of an option. And it can look like a lot of things. It can be intrapreneur, where you're in a company and you're innovating and you're creating something interesting. It could be an entrepreneur with a startup. And when you think about it, I think in Canada, something like 95,000 new startups were started last year and almost every year. That's 260 new businesses a day. And I look at some of the small firms that I've worked with in coaching and, you know, there, there was one that was an, an egg free product and another was um, a mental health program online where you could um, get connected with um, um, emotional support. And then another is a dog walker where she has a team of 10 people who walk dogs and is actually, she has a full-time job, but she also has this other business. And so the possibilities abound for you to consider what that could look like. And I know that when I say it, people will say, well, I don't have the money. 
But I want to go back to those days 33 years ago where I, we didn't, I had $750 that I borrowed from my grandma. I still have the check that I finally paid her back with interest because my grandmother was pretty, it was a stickler. If I'm going to loan you some money, you're going to pay me interest. And uh, it took me a little while to give her her thousand dollars back. Um, that was including the interest because she was a bit of a loan shark. But anyhow, I'm kidding. Um, it was really, really special that she was able to help me do that. But I know that in your life, there are multiple programs out there from Futurepreneur to other organizations that do provide loans to entrepreneurs. There are also a whole range of mentorship possibilities and you can get a mentor match and someone can support you in developing your business plan, your business ideas. I know we went to the business development bank and they charged us a small amount just to help us write our business plan way back then. And so I'm really encouraging you when you're contemplating what that next step is for you to not be held back by, I don't have capital, what's possible. I don't have enough of a plan. There are people there to support you. Maybe you think, well, the ideas have all been done, but it's not true because in every space of the entire economy, there's always room for improvement. And what is the improvement that you can bring to that possibility? I, I think that you probably have a great idea right now. And then when you go into business, the concept of freedom, I want to go there. People always tell me, oh, you're, you're an entrepreneur. You have all this freedom. You don't have to work. It's so not true. I mean, I find that business owners and founders are really committed to what they do. And I'm so committed to my team and, and to my future that I'm about growth and I'm not giving up. And I'm certainly not someone who's going to go sit by the, the sidelines and watch things go. I actually want to participate. So when I see what's happening for entrepreneurs, I want you to know that you're going to work really hard, but you're also going to be really excited to see the results that you, that you seek. Um, and finally, I want to talk about gender. Um, we don't see as many female entrepreneurs or we do see some, but then they tend to often leave entrepreneurship when they have a family. And I, I do want to encourage you as young women, if, if you're considering that, to, to look for advisors that are other women who've also had to break through some of those gender gaps um, that exist. I mean, when I sit at a CEO council, I'm often not the only woman among, you know, a sea of 15 or 20 men. Sometimes there's one other woman. And it's taking time for that change to come. But, you know, you do have people you know, blazing ahead of you and trying to make space for you to do that. And I encourage you to, to uh, consider entrepreneurship as something that you bring into your life. So I'm going to turn right away now to what time 1223. I want to make sure I leave at least 10 to 15 minutes for your job search, because I know that when I was in university, one of the big thoughts I had uh, in college and in university was to really to re-explore what my career was going to be. And so I want to focus on the Ottawa region simply because if you're at Algonquin, a school that I truly value, by the way, I, I have been enamored with the work that Algonquin has done for many years because so many of Algonquin graduates end up doing such incredible things in our city that you know, you're at the right place. You've made a really good choice there. It looks great on your resume. So you're starting from a good position, but I wanna to turn to how are you gonna secure work and what does that look like? So. We're going to start with the fact that you're looking for work in this graduate period that you're about to come upon at an excellent time. Um, the vacancies I read today was 850,000 open positions. I've also read up to 900,000 vacancies. Um, there's a huge, large number of people that are, are retiring. I've read between 14 to 16 percent of Canadians will retire in the next one to two years. That leaves a ton of amazing positions coming up. And um, businesses are feeling that there's a real shortage of talent. So here you are graduating or coming up to graduation at a great time. So I wanna to talk to you about, you know, what is it that you're going to do in your employment? I would like you to be really straight with yourself about where the jobs are. I often do find that people graduate and say, well, you know, I kind of want to do this certain career, but they haven't taken the steps to build their resume, their network and, even their volunteer or other experience in that sector. And I'd really like to see you take the time to stop and say, these are two things I like. I don't know what it could be. Look at the top 10 careers in demand. I mean, there are software developers. Um, let's say I made myself a list, project managers, uh, customer service special, specialists, digital marketers, lots of work in the communications field, um, lots of work in HR, HR generalists, recruiters. IT support, help desk, financial analysts, controllers, graphic designers. There is a great demand for what you are learning right now. So when you, when you look at the demand for what you're doing, if you could try to look at your resume today, say, what am I doing right now to build towards it? 
Okay. It doesn't mean that because there are a lot of jobs that you're guaranteed a job. Of course not. You're going to work really hard to find that right space, but at least you know that there is a demand for what you do due to the shortage that's coming our way. So the first thing I'm going to say is I want you to try right now to get some experience. And if you say, well, I have experience kind of maybe, I don't want you being that person who graduates um, from Algonquin and says, okay, well, I haven't started my thoughts. I want today you showed up at this event. And I congratulate you for showing up. Everyone who shows up in the world just has that extra bright spot for, for um, something you've learned that you can take away, even the connection to me. And maybe there's something where I'll participate with you to help you in your first position or someone on our team well. So I'm really, I'm happy that you're here. So let's start with getting some experience. You have more experience than you know, and you have transfer, tra transferable skills. I was having trouble with that word, transferable. So I want you to reflect on all the things you're doing in your classwork with your, with your professors and all of the clubs you might belong to, some of the volunteer work you're doing, the work you do um, in the groups where you're presenting or whatever other parts you're, you're playing in that, you are gaining experience. And if you can look at how that wave of experience is coming and keep notes for yourself, maybe you have a little, I'm sure that you have a profile for yourself, keep building around some of the things you're seeing yourself bring to it, because those are the transferable skills that in an interview and someone says, well, have you ever led a discussion? Yes, actually I have in my whatever group that was and I participated as follows and I created and here's my product and here's the, the final project. There are so many things that you're doing right now that if you can acknowledge how great they are, it will make a difference in your confidence. I want to talk to you about the gig economy and I say gig and some people say that's a bad word. I think the gig economy is amazing because in the staffing sector, we place a number of temporary and contract employees or workers, consultants, independent consultants. Sometimes you're often independent businesses. Let's go there for a moment. It's an incredible space for two reasons. One, it's for very senior professionals who want to keep working and do contracts at will. When they want to work, they can choose a contract. There's the whole other side of the gamut where it could be a student, it could be someone who's between jobs, it could be someone trying to gain skills. And they go ahead and do temporary work in order to gain skills. So I want you to look at temporary work differently than how your parents might have. I know that my parents are like, oh, you do temporary work just as a temporary gig, but that's not true. You can actually create a whole career of having various gig related positions that really matter. And the gig economy is growing by 17% a year. Why? Because people like yourself, want choices. They want to be able to have multiple positions. They want to be able to have a startup company and also do some work. They want to be able to travel and have a contract that lasts six months. So I want you to know that because the, the whole notion of contract work has changed, consider it as a really good source of gaining experience. Okay. So don't sit there and think, oh, I'm not going to do contract work. Go for it. You apply with a firm like ourselves or many other firms out there. I'm not afraid of our competition. Go, go see who can help you be introduced to a great opportunity. So next I want to talk about LinkedIn. Everyone has such different opinions about this, but I'm going to give you mine. LinkedIn is an incredibly powerful tool. I don't need to tell you that. I'm pretty sure you know it, but make it count right now. And I know that your career counselors at Algonquin are already telling you this, but I'm going to reinforce it. If you, let's say, said you wanted to go into the food and beverage industry, go look up executives, HR professionals, people in careers that you, you aspire to and start inviting them as connections to you. Start creating a network and give yourself a goal. If currently you have 500 people that you're connected to, have a goal of 5,000. Imagine if you had 5,000 people connected to you related to a field that you desire. Then as you continue to flow, you will um, possibly start sharing content that they have. You will um, share something that they've had or sorry, like what they have or start communicating with them through LinkedIn. And then when you graduate, you could post something saying, hey, I've graduated. And I have the following skills. I'm really interested in the following industry. Are you looking? I have a young person that I know in the city who did exactly that and secured three job offers. So if you think that LinkedIn is not a solution, it really is. And please don't hold yourself back. If your English is your second language, it's okay. There's a huge openness. If you feel that I don't know, there's ages and maybe you're, you've gone back to, to college and, and you're in your 40s and 50s and thinking, is there a place for me? There's definitely a place for you. So I want you to show up on LinkedIn in a whole new way. I'm expecting you to connect to me on LinkedIn. I'm expecting you to connect to our company and all of the companies that really inspire you. Okay, so I'm going to stop now on federal government. I want to talk FedGov because 
such a major sector in Ottawa. So there's two ways you're going to go at possibly getting into the government. Okay, I'm going to go there straight away. First of all, you could go to, um, it's called Canada.ca, and you go to the Public Service Commission, and then you can apply there and create a profile on GC Jobs. When you're on GC Jobs, you can start seeing what the government is looking for. Well, go look and see, because what if you really want a federal government position? You're going to see what they're hiring for, and then you're going to be able to pivot around some of the coursework you're doing, some of the volunteer work, some of the work you're doing, paid work, that is going to lead you to that. So I want you to think about that now. Don't wait till you've graduated, because it can take two to three years to secure a permanent position in the government, but it can even take up to five. You're often offered a term. And oftentimes it is temporary employment, which I'm going to lead to next. A lot of times someone comes to a staffing firm like ourselves, they do temporary employment, they go on to another temporary position in the government, they go on to another one, and then suddenly their resume starts to show that they understand Transport Canada, agriculture, industry, they start to know the government departments. And now suddenly they become a more, you know, hotter commodity, right? Because they have this experience. So they've worked temp and then they can start applying for some of these other positions and they have a better profile. So now you're going to ask, well, what about security clearances? I can almost hear you wondering about that. And you're right, you should be wondering because clearances matter. Uh, when I first started the business, there were no clearances. This was pre 9-11. After September 11th, Clearances became about 70% of the positions that were staffed, and now it's pretty much 100%. I don't think we see positions that don't require an enhanced clearance or a secret clearance, and these clearances take time. So the first thing I need you to know is that you have to have been in Canada for at least five years to apply for an enhanced clearance. And if you think, well, I'm going to apply at two years, it's not going to work. You have to have the five years experience for enhanced, and you need 10 years for secret. So what would happen is you would apply with our firm because we are a facilitator of clearances. We would meet with you. And if we thought there was a possibility that we could place you, we would then initiate the clearance on your behalf. And then it takes two months, four months, six months. It takes time to get it. But once you have it, now suddenly you're positioned to be able to put on your resume that you have an enhanced clearance. And how wonderful is that? Because it can give you the leg up for an opportunity. So the fact that you showed up today, this could be something that matters to you because you'd be able to do that and we're the only company in the country that offers free um, fingerprinting for our candidates. Now, it's not globally for the entire world, but it's for anyone who is our candidate. Um, we don't expect you to pay for your fingerprinting, which is $35 to $80. Um, you can do it free with us. And um, we try to support you in developing your government career. So we want to be a solution. Now, you're going to ask about bilingualism. I just heard that question in my mind. So you're right. Being fluent in English and French matters for the federal government. Um, obviously, you know, we support a bilingual nation um, and there are English only positions. So you can apply to the federal government English only, no problem. The only thing is that when you hit that managerial level and you wanna start growing, it is really important that you have some level of French. And when I say some level, I mean B. So in the government, they classify language by A, B, C, E. E is exempt. It means the person speaks French fluently. And B and C are the levels that we would want to see you achieve. I believe it's possible for you to get a B level. And so if you don't speak a lot of French right now, or you have a semi level of it, why not start now? You know, Algonquin has courses in French, take some courses and keep developing your language skills. And that might include English as well, but certainly a B level is what's required. I would encourage you, if you think you want a career in the federal government, go work on your French now. You can't, you know, magically decide that you want to be bilingual. It's something you have to do a little bit more. So I need to move on because I want to end in another minute. Okay, so I'm going to try to hurry along. So I'm going to encourage you to really build your network on LinkedIn. I'm going to encourage you to start having coffee chats with people that matter to you in your community. I want you to link to your professors because some of them will be your allies in the future when you're looking for work. I want you to register with a few staffing firms, get your clearance going. I'd like to see you work on what your transferable skills are. Every time you're doing an assignment, a volunteer position, anything, I want you to reflect on what you're gaining there that you could optimize in an interview. Talking about optimizing, let's look at that resume. When you go and you put your resume on LinkedIn, Indeed, Monster, ZipRecruiter, you're going to use them all. You want your resume to use common language that is often searched because you want your resume to come out in all the, the searches that recruiters are doing. So don't worry about fancy formatting and perfection on your resume. Don't worry about that. Put the words that are commonly sought, okay? When I go look up your LinkedIn, I hope to see your photo, your career aspirations. I wanna start seeing your, your connections grow, okay? 
I want to talk about your resume for a minute as it relates to LinkedIn. We often see people put on LinkedIn things that aren't exactly accurate to their resume. Your resume and LinkedIn have to match. If your dates are off, it doesn't seem quite right. Make sure that you're being honest on both. Prepare for that virtual interview. If you want to participate, we have a virtual interview career series, and we can teach you a little bit about how to show up online. 80% of interviews will be online for the next two years, the virtual in this environment. So I wanna teach you to be amazing at that because you can show up and really be incredible. Do not show up at an interview without having researched that company. You don't wanna be that person who's like, I have no idea what you do. <laughs> I don't know why I want this job. You know, you wanna show up more prepared. So I'd like to see you work on that. And um, I think some of you might ask about trends in remote work. You might say, well, should I look for remote or on site? I would encourage you, if you can, and if you're willing, go do some on-site work initially in your career, because in that time of eyeballing people, you'll be able to build your network a bit better, and some of your learning will be a little bit easier when it's on-site. If that doesn't appeal to you and you go remote, that's perfectly fine too. It's just in the learning segment, you have to be a little bit more open to learning in that virtual way. So I'm going to wrap up so I leave room for some questions. Um, I think that's really important, and I'll answer anything that you have. What I'd like to say is that my leadership journey just was not a straight line. It really went from kind of what I believed to be true to, you know, losing my life partner, to rebuilding the career and the business that I intended to becoming myself to a pandemic, seeing my way through that, realizing that we were not doing enough in the space of allyship and diversity and really being becoming a true ally in that space. And then going on to continue to re recreate and then to now face Ukraine and the invasion of Ukraine at this time. So there's just been an incredible journey. And I think what you would, you would say here listening is that there is no straight line for a business or for a career. And I know you've, been, you've probably had setbacks as you listen to this, you're thinking about a setback you've had, but it's really what you make of the setback. And the fact that you showed up today, well, perhaps that's showing something about yourself that you're looking for something in your life. And I hope that you connect with our firm and I hope that you connect with your leaders at Algonquin to see how they can participate in helping your career really become what you want it to be. And certainly I'm standing behind you for that. So thank you. I wanna thank you again for inviting me, uh, Carol Ann. Um, and Lauren, you were really exceptional in this process. And um, I'm really glad that you gave me a chance to chat with you today. Catherine, thank you so much. That was incredible. So many insights, so many little tidbits and takeaways. I cannot wait to dive into a few questions with you. Um, but one that popped up just a few moments ago is a couple of people are wondering if you could expand a little bit more on what the gig econ or the gig world is. They're not too, too familiar with that. Okay. Oh, I love that question. Thank you so much for asking that. I say gig, but I'm really talking about contract work. So I want you to picture that every day we get positions from companies, employers, both government, broader public service and private sector. And there are positions that are for a day, a month, a year, and even longer. So the positions that we get would be something like it's an employer that has a project and they need something to get done for the next eight weeks, they call us and say, we need someone. Imagine if that someone is you and you go in, you do a temporary assignment for eight weeks. First of all, you make money. Second of all, you create a network. Third of all, your resume is starting to look pretty smashing because you now just got eight weeks of really incredible experience. You're able to add that job title. And more than anything, I really encourage you when you take a temporary assignment to go and network with the people that you're working with either online or in person, because when you graduate, now suddenly that whole network opens up to you. And when we place temporary employees, so like remember when I was telling you at the start that we have we make about 8,000 placements a year and at any given time we have about 2,000 contract employees working. These are 2,000 people working in contract positions. A lot of those positions, especially in private sector, become permanent. Uh, it used to be a number of around 40%. It's more like 35 now, but about 35% of positions that are temporary be, are offered as permanent employment. So the reason I want you to consider this is that as you start to get closer to your graduation, why not work a temporary position in the summer or throughout the year, whenever that works for you to help you gain experience. I'm gonna turn just briefly, I hope it's okay, Lauren. We also hire co-ops in our company, about 10 a year, and many companies hire co-ops and that's from Algonquin and from other local schools. And we encourage you to apply with us um, for those co-ops because when you get that experience, 
you know, in between your semesters at school, it really does allow something to open up for you when you start looking for work later and we act as a reference for you and we really support you in lifting your career up. So I'm really encouraging you to consider contract work. And that's what I mean by gig. Gig could be part-time work, could be contract work. It could be short, it could be longer, it could be co-op. And all of those are possibilities. Perfect, thank you. Um, and we have a question in the Q&A, which I think segues perfectly into this, but they're asking um, that, I was told that moving around a lot is a red flag on a resume because it shows a company that you don't stick around for very long and it may not be worth the investment in the new hire. Uh, is this not the case when businesses look at your resume? Oh, I also love that question. These are really smart questions. Thank you for that. Um, I actually have two diverging opinions. So I hope it's okay, Lauren. I'm going to give yes, two sides to this point, okay? On one side, I'm saying, go ahead and accept temporary work and contract work to make to beef up your resume and to create a network. And on your resume, you're going to put contract or temporary. It's okay. Every employer understands that there are mo multiple positions out there that are temporary. Now turn to the other side of the equation. If you accept a permanent position and it's acceptably good, I don't mean it's great. Maybe it's not everything you dreamed of. Maybe it's a seven on 10. I would recommend that you try to stay for two years. And okay, so I'm going there with you. There could be other opinions in the audience that might say otherwise. I find that if you're going from permanent job to permanent job every single year, you never quite become a master of anything. It's important to try to stay somewhere for enough time that you go through a full year cycle of all the things that that business went through you start to position yourself more as an expert. And sometimes at that two year mark is when you're ready to move up. And that gives you career progression. It's hard to have career progression when you never give the career long enough. It's almost like work-life balance, Lauren. People say, I really want balance, but first you have to start with work. You have to work to get balance. You can't just have balance. Like, they're, they're, you know, you need both. So you need to work to get that possibility of staying in a position for two years. And I would love to see you, if you're in a position right now and you're at the 12 month mark, you're like, hey, I don't love it. Okay, can you go speak with your team member, your boss, mm -hmm. your team and say, can I gain more skills? Can I volunteer for the health and safety committee and learn something there? Can I volunteer on the diversity committee? Can I participate in making something better, maybe a special project? And from those special projects, you might be able to springboard to your next better and much the position you really desire, but it's like, you got to do some of that legwork. So I like this question because yes, do temporary work and show that it was temporary in contract and try to stay two years when it's a permanent position. So those are two diverging thoughts, but I think you understand what I mean. Yeah. And, and they're great. And it's, it's a good reminder too, for, for new employees who are just entering um, their first job, they may not always want to ask the questions or kind of create those waves, but it's important to kind of really ask those questions and start to move around and get more involved in the company that they're in. Absolutely. Perfect. So this is another question. It's a little bit of a, a hot topic lately, I think, but um, someone's asking if you have any suggestions or tips for graduates who are looking for work and coming across entry-level postings that require three to five years experience. Oh, I'm so with you on that. I sometimes cry over this because we'll get a requirement for someone with a technology where the technology is only two years old and they want five years experience and it doesn't make sense. So I'm totally with you on this. Like if I was standing with you, I'd be standing on your side. I would recommend that you apply to everything, even if you aren't quite the candidate that it says that is required. Okay. Because I, I, I read a stat recently that 63% of employers will consider less experience for something else. So I would go there. Um, I agree with you that sometimes the request for experience is too high for the situation. And the only thing I can encourage you to do is to really be serious with yourself about gaining experience you can. It might not be perfectly related. It could be volunteering at the school. It could be doing a special project in your class. It could be whatever position you're in right now and trying to do a stretch assignment to add something to it. It could be asking friends and family if you can mentor with them and shadow them in their career so that you can gain some insights and also doing a lot of interview rehearsal so that you are really ready to secure the position. Because let's be honest, the interview really does count. So you've got to get into that interview. And then when you're there, you've really got to make it count. And I do find that people undersell themselves. And I'm going to encourage you to be a little bit more boastful. I do think that sometimes young people have everything they need, but they don't boast. And I would love to see a little bit more. And I'm not saying boast, like falsify. I'm saying boast to really show what you're capable of. And and write it out. And if you want to join us, I don't know who asked this question, but 
I would love to welcome you to come to some of our job search series and we'll work with you on working on your resume to, to show the skills that you have, working on your interview and having the confidence to ask for the job that you want. Those are three parts and they're each equally important. That's great. Sometimes we have to be our, our own personal cheerleader. So I Absolutely. think I think that's a great, great advice. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a couple a couple HR graduates um, in who are watching today. And one of them is asking, um, as a HR graduate, uh, mm -hmm. they're not able to find internships in their field. Do you have any strategies or places to look for these? Oh, I feel for you. I know how hard it is to get that first foot in the door. Um, I'll tell you for our company, we have, um, they're not quite HR internships, but we have talent sourcer internships. And what that means is you come in and you help us locate entry level candidates and kind of feel out the market. Um, we hire, we have a program called AIM and it's apprenticeship basically. And we bring you in as a paid apprentice to learn in our company and grow with us. So that could be something for you to contemplate, but to get into HR straight away, I think I would encourage you to consider breaking down what HR is and looking at, can you get it? Payroll is a very big um, opportunity for people there. It's very hard for us to staff payroll positions. And so if you're able to get in and do payroll and benefits, perhaps you're able to get into recruitment. Recruitment's another hard position to staff. Health and safety, everything with COVID today, mental health, everything around health and safety is really critical to companies. So instead of thinking about HR as a big global idea, if you could try to break that down into smaller segments and apply to be something more like, you know, a clerk in the payroll area, perhaps a talent source or the most junior position that you could enter into in recruitment, you know, to almost try to start from a slightly more junior position in a more narrow space that then allows you to navigate the space. Mm -hmm. Because when you ask for HR, it sounds almost too big. I don't know if that makes sense to you as a, as a new grad, but you're thinking, I want HR. HR what? Do you mean compensation? Do you mean employee relations? Do you mean culture and vision? So it might help you to, to be a bit more narrow in your search. That's what I would do if I was in HR. Perfect. Thank you. I, I, hope, I hope that answers your question. Uh, so if it doesn't, please feel free to drop it back into the, the Q&A or just send us a follow-up. Um, Switching gears just a little bit, uh, we have another question on any tips for approaching a company who does not have a posting, but this person is looking for volunteer work or field placement to see if they're willing to take them on. I think that's a wonderful question. I want to remind you that in Canada, it's actually illegal to have unpaid um, apprentices. So in the United States, you know how everyone's an intern and they work for free? It's not legal in Canada to do that because there are issues around worker safety, um, our government's concerned with giving, like imagine if every student work un worked unpaid. We don't want that. We want our, our students to make money and we don't want them just, you know, floating around, not being able to earn an income. So when you, sorry, if we can go back to the question, um, if you were trying to apply to a position where, or a company where there is no, no position posted, first thing I would do is I would go to LinkedIn and I would search on the company name and on the people that work there. I would send an email that's very polite. It happens to me every day. And the very polite email is, I have a keen interest in your company. I would really like to take on any assignment. Um, I'm willing to shadow or volunteer. I'm willing to do an unpaid mentorship. I'd also love to take a part-time student position on. And I'm skilled at the following three things. And the, here's how to reach me. Do this multiple times, do it over and over. Okay, like I really mean, you can't just do something once and think it's gonna work, right? So you've got to keep repeating. And someone out there might think, oh, look at this great person who's really keeps applying and will give you that chance. But, but again, it is a numbers game. And I think sometimes people today are a bit shy to put themselves out there and it's okay to put yourself out there. Think of how our company has succeeded is through reaching out to candidates and reaching out to employers. And we can't, be, we can't be light about that. We have to be extremely consistent. So I'd encourage you to be consistent, target those companies, target them on LinkedIn and, be, and keep going. Oh, I, re, I tried to reach you last month and I didn't reach you. Are you, are you looking now? Because at some point they have a pain point and they think, oh, look at this student that's reached out to me seven times. <laughs> I think I'll call them. So I, that's where I would go with it, Lauren, is I'd be really consistent and I would use LinkedIn as my tool. Okay. And uh, now, great advice. Are there any 
red flags there from an employer standpoint if this person I persistency is good but if they keep on persisting do you think oh that's a great question Lauren you know yes I think that if it's daily and weekly um, and if there's no precision in what is being requested is more of a challenge but sometimes like when I get these I, I usually look at it and say okay can I help this person Mm -hmm. I try to align them with someone in our firm. I ask them to reach out to that person. I, and I, I try to invest in them to help them. So I, I haven't found persistence to be excessive. I think that a monthly touch point saying I'm still interested is not excessive. It doesn't have to be a long winded seven paragraph event. It can simply be, I'm really interested in your company. Okay, great. Uh, another question, how can students with disabilities begin to create their career? Mm, thank you so much for asking that. Disabilities can be on two fronts, could be physical, and it could also be a learning disability or an emotional um, irregulation. And, and I support you, um, whoever answered that, asked that question, because it, it is a, a greater difficulty. The first thing I would do is I would connect with some of the, the organizations. If you connect with me on LinkedIn, I'll send you the names of the local um, companies that I deal with. And these are organizations that help individuals with physical disabilities um, get into a position where they provide you with a support person to help you get into it either. However, it is to set up your technology, to set up your phone, to uh, basically adapt your work environment to match your requirement. There's also the Learning Disability Association of Ontario, and they also provide some supports around if you have a learning disability. I will say that thankfully, learning disabilities are much more acknowledged today than they ever were before. And goodness, I know that um, I have a, a child with a learning disability, and I will say that it was quite challenging initially because people didn't seem to get it. Whereas today, I feel like when you say, hey, I, le I learned this way, and can you provide me with the following method to learn? People seem to be more open to it. There's more accommodation. Thank goodness that, that it, it is a human right. So I want to encourage you, the person who asked this question, to not give up. And to not take any kind of no as a, as a personal affront, it's not personal. Sometimes it's the employer that doesn't know how to make the accommodation. And you may have to participate with the employer a little bit more to describe the accommodation you need. For example, we switched all of our training to written, video, closed caption, um, you know, verbal one-on-one. -on -one. Like we've had to change how we teach because we used to teach in one very simple teacher to student talking at you. And now we're using more graphs more visuals, more visual cues, you know, we're, we're all changing and adapting to allow the, the learner to adapt to how they learn. So for this person, you know, I honor you in this journey. I know it's a little bit harder, but certainly um, on the physical piece of it, gain that support. And if it's a learning disability, um, be open about how it is that you learn and what you need for accommodation. And employers are much more aware of it today and will support you in that journey. Thank you. We have time for, I'd say maybe one or two more questions. Um, so we have another one and they're curious about how to stay motivated and optimistic during a job search. It's really easy to get discouraged when you don't get the interview or you get the interview, but don't get the job. So mm -hmm. do you have any tips for, for staying motivated? Oh, I love that question too. You have wonderful questions. Your audience is really uh, motivated in the right spaces. Um, it is discouraging. And you know, the thing is, is that we have to acknowledge and not pretend. And I, something I learned in leadership in this journey has been, I'm so sorry, um, <laughs> is to not um, allow for performative behavior. So performative would be for me to answer you like, oh, no problem. You got this. Just be motivated. That's not true. So I'm not performing when I'm answering this. I'm saying to you, I recognize and acknowledge that it is very, very difficult to stay motivated when you get no's. But the point here is that you can't expect just because you put a resume out that the receiver is interested. They don't know you. It's not personal. If they don't acknowledge you as a candidate, it's not because you're not wonderful. They don't know you. You're just a piece of paper. And think about the average HR person, the recruiter, reads the resume in less than 30 seconds, generally 19 seconds on the first page and eight seconds on the second page. Okay, that's the average recruiter. So when they see your resume and and pass over it it's not because you're not wonderful you are it's just they don't see that because they skipped over it because maybe they were looking for a certain word or they, they, there was something they were looking for that you might not be aware of so really don't take it personally and when you when you talk about this this motivation is that I want you to think about almost a, a numbers game write down on your board 
that it's going to take you 100 um, applications to get 10 interviews to secure one position. And if you go into it thinking, I sent three resumes, I should get a position. That is really false. You really have to go the 110 to one. And, and it's really important. And think about, I did this course years back that I was telling you about where they said we were doing 10 million in revenue. And the course leader said, what's it gonna take for you to do hundred million? I'm like, we can't do that. That's not possible, but it is a numbers game. It's what are you doing to put out actions that create a result? And if you focus on the action, you'll be motivated because instead of thinking about, I didn't get this, you'll think, I guess I better apply my 71st time. I'm at number 71 and get yourself to hundred. And when you're at hundred and you still haven't secured something, then you call me or somebody like me and you say, walk me through this. What am I missing? But you've mm -hmm. got to do the numbers game. Don't get, and so the motivation comes from your actions and not expecting things to come your way. You don't know what the receiver is up against. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't know yeah. what they're reading. I mean, they might have 50 resumes and yours just kind of didn't float to the top and they went to the other person. It's not because you're not great. It's not personal. And if you don't secure the position after an interview, I would recommend you send a short email and say, I'm a new grad and I'm trying to understand what I'm doing well. And I would love a quick five minute phone interview with you to let me know what I could have done better in the interview. Because sometimes a person shows up in an interview and they're very negative, but they don't know they were being negative mm -hmm. or they don't sell themselves. They just kind of, oh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. And they, they don't say much about how great they are. They're asked about computer skills and they say things like, yeah, I've got computer skills. Well, what do you have? Have you worked with Canva and Excel and PowerPoint? Like, show, tell me, what is it that you've done? So yeah. sometimes people are a little bit not boastful enough. And then the person interviewing them doesn't know how great they are. Mm -hmm. And that feedback would help develop a better um, answer. Yeah, using those using those tangible examples and and giving the employer those mm -hmm. those scenarios that you've had experience in. All right, I think we have time to squeeze in one more uh, one more question. We have a lot, so I'll encourage you all. Um, I'll have Samantha drop Catherine's contact info in the chat again to maybe take this offline and and reach out to Catherine. Um, but we'll close off with a question a little bit more on the entrepreneurial side of things. Um, so do you have any advice that you would give to new or young graduate entrepreneurs who might not be taken as seriously because of their age or experience? Oh, wow. Another great question. Thank you for that one. Um, I would say there is that, you know, I was a 21 year old young woman. I hadn't finished university um, or college. I, I actually didn't really know what I was up to. I just knew I wanted to start a business and um, I don't think I was taken that seriously. And yet I never really took that very serious. I don't care what the other person thinks of me. That's their opinion. So I'm going to tell you whoever asked that question, I'm glad you did because you have some passion there and it doesn't matter what your religion, your race, your gender, your age, just park that. That's the other person's problem. Your problem is starting your business. And if you have an idea or you want to perfect something out there, get out there and start your journey. It's not going to be easy. You're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to look for capital. You're going to look for your, you're going to create your business plan. You're going to look for mentors. But if you let yourself be held back by the thing, which could be, you know, race, gender, um, perhaps English is not your second language, that that's their problem. That's the receiver's problem. It's not yours. And if you make it, if I had said, oh, I'm 21, I'm a girl, I have no money. I come from Orleans and I've not finished my degree. Well, you know, maybe I wouldn't be where I am now. It's like, just ignore the possibility of the other person's negativity. That's their negativity. It's not yours. Don't own their problem. Their objection is their objection. It's not yours. And, and I would really strongly urge them to get started on their business plan. Look at the actions they have to take and ignore the outside noise because there will always be noise. There'll always be mm -hmm. someone who wants to say no to us but we have the possibility to say yes to ourselves, right? It, only we can affect that. That's wonderful. Thank you so, so much. We are unfortunately out of time. Um, so I'll give you an opportunity if you do have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to share with, with our guests today, please, please do. Um, I think I'll just close by saying I'm a big fan of Algonquin College. And for those that are here that are students, um, I want to tell you, you made a good choice with this school. I have placed thousands, literally thousands of people from Algonquin. 
and um, wonderful people, wonderful um, employer as an employer, but also wonderful um, teaching students. So just really get involved. I would hate to see you graduate. I interviewed someone recently who said they never went to a resume workshop. They never attended anything at the school. They had no idea what they wanted to do. And as a favor to a friend, I interviewed the, the student and I felt badly that they had done no work in advance mm -hmm. to be prepared for their future. And so you're here today and this is your chance to prepare. So write out that plan you have for yourself. What's the preparedness that you can bring to your career and start that career planning now. You don't have to be perfect about it. Just get started so that when you graduate, you kind of have something, almost a little framework from which to draw, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so my closing remarks, I love your school and I know your students are great. And I hope that we can participate with you in your growth, either as an entrepreneur or in your career search. And, you know, we're here for you for both. And if you have more questions, you can send them our way and we'll do our best over the next couple of days to respond to any other questions you have. That's awesome. Again, thank you so, so much, Catherine, for joining us today and, and giving us your time. We do hope you feel, feel better and we hope to be able to have you on campus in person in the, in the coming months. Um, but it was an absolute pleasure listening and learning from you today. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you for all your hard work that you put into getting this together. I'm sorry that we had planned our in person and I had to change, but I couldn't bring in could bring COVID to the COVID to the crew, you know. So I'm home for the week. And and we still got to connect with, with you. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us today online. And a huge thank you to Carol Ann. Uh, this event was recorded. So if you want to watch it again or share with anyone in your network, it will be available on the third Thursday website. And once again, thank you and have a great third Thursday, last Thursday edition. That Thanks, was everyone. Great. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs>